Blackboard lecture series. In this talk, I am going to take you through the normal appearance of the ocular surface. Also give you some examples when this normal appearance is distorted because of ocular surface pathologies and eventually make the point that no understanding the normal can help all of us in identifying the abnormality that we expect to see when there are pathological changes in the ocular surface. The first thing that you should pay attention to or notice when you see a patient on the slit lamp is the reflection of the filament of the bulb of the slit lamp on the eye. And uh, you know we are seeing so many patients every day this is something that we do not necessarily notice or pay attention to. But if you know how to recognize the normal um, appearance of this reflex uh, this is you know representative of the luster or wetness of the surface or regularity of the surface. And if this is uh, abnormal or distorted, it immediately tells us that there is something wrong on the surface and therefore, we must pay closer attention. Here, I am going to explain to you the normal lid globe apposition and also the normal direction of the lashes. If you pay close attention, you will see that the upper lid covers a little bit of the superior cornea. The cornea is you know extends up to here superiorly. And so it covers about the couple of millimeters of the cornea superiorly. This is the normal resting position of the upper lid when the patient is looking straight ahead. But the lower lid actually does not cover any part of the cornea. It about just about abuts or touches the inferior limbus. And this position uh, is, is uh, very important to understand. The other is that if you look at this photograph of the eye, you will see that the the puncta whether it is a superior puncta or the inferior puncta are not usually visible when you are looking at the patient the patient is looking straight ahead. You need to pull the skin of the eyelid and evert the, uh, the medial part of the eyelid a little bit to be able to see the puncta and this is because the puncta are directed posteriorly so that they can drain the tear leg and they are not visible immediately and uh, if they are that means that there is something wrong with the eyelid. The final point I would make on this slide um, is about the direction of the lashes. If you look at the upper lid, you will see that the lashes they are you know they have a curve and the curve is different in the upper lid and the lower lid. In the upper lid it has two bends. So, it is initially goes downwards then forwards and then upwards. Okay? So, there are three parts in this curve whereas in the lower lid it first goes upwards then forwards and then downwards. So, again two lids here. This gives the lashes their characteristic shape uh, uh, in the upper lid and the lower lid. In these photographs, we are going to look at some of the abnormalities because of lid position. Um, in the top left photograph uh, is uh, you know what lid retraction uh, looks like and this is in the upper lid and you can see that the upper lid as I mentioned before should have been somewhere over here covering about a millimeter or two of the upper cornea, but it is actually much further back and therefore you have superior lid retraction and scleral show. Whereas in the photograph of the top right hand corner, you see that the lid position is lower than it should be. Uh, it should have been somewhere over here, but it is a couple of millimeters below normal. So, this is a case of ptosis. In the photograph in the middle, if you compare the two eyes, you can clearly make out that there is more scleral show in the left eye and this is because of inferior lid retraction. Lid retraction is something that is most commonly seen in patients with thyroid eye disease, although it can also result from a number of other causes including conjunctival cicatrization. Uh, in the photograph uh, at the bottom, uh, we see a lag of thalamus. So, you can see here that there is a uh, you know when the patient closes the eye there is a gap between the upper and the lower lid. What I want to emphasize here is that once you diagnose a patient with lag of thalamus or you notice that the patient has lag of thalamus when the patient blinks or tries to close the eye, you immediately check for Bell's phenomenon. This is something that should be a reflex for all of us because if the Bell's is normal then there is no risk of the patient developing uh, exposure keratopathy. But if the bells is fair to poor and there is some amount of cornea that is exposed when the lids uh, when the patient tries to close both the lids, then there is a very good chance that the patient will 
develop keratopathy and that something needs to be done about that. So whenever you see lag of thalamus, please do check for the Bell's phenomenon. Some other path pathologies of lid position on the photograph on your top left, you see a patient with ectropia. Now, I remember I told you that you should not be able to see the puncta here. You can see not the tarsal conjunctiva, the intermarginal strip, uh, all of which which are not routinely visible like you see, you know, in the upper lid, you can't see all of these things. Uh, and you can also see uh, puncta over here. And this is because this patient has secretarial ectropion because of contracture of the eyelid, lower eyelid skin. Uh, because of contact dermatitis. Uh, on the photograph on the top right, you see tracheatic lashes. So, you see these two lashes over here, which are not following the normal direction of the other lashes, but are actually pointed upwards or backwards towards the eye. And you also see a corresponding area of scarring on the cornea, uh, which basically means that the tracheatic lashes may be rubbing on the cornea and causing this keratopathy. In the photograph uh, on in the bottom, you see a patient with both upper lid and a lower lid uh, entropion and because of the entropion, uh, the lashes look really uh, flat and this is known as lastosis. This patient may not necessarily have tracheasis, but because of the entropion itself, the lashes uh, may get secondarily uh, directed in a wrong way. Now, Coming to the intermarginal strip, you can see the photograph on the top is of the upper lid, the photograph on the bottom is of the lower lid. And in my earlier talk on the lid margin keratinization, I explained this, but I'll go through this quickly again. In between, uh, you can see the gray line over here, which is more prominent uh, over here in the lower lid. The gray line uh, more or less splits the intermarginal strip equally into the anterior lamella, which contains the skin, the lashes and the uh, orbiculus muscle and the posterior lamella which contains the tarsal plate and the meibomian glands which are within the tarsal plate. Um, uh, and similarly here in the lower lid you see the same thing, the intermarginal uh, strip is uh, split by the grey line into the anterior lamina and posterior lamina and um, in the anterior lamella you have the orbicularis and the lashes uh, and in the posterior lamella you have um, the tarsal plate with the meibomian glands. Uh, if you evert the upper lid and you look at the intermarginal strip, um, you can see this in the lower lid also. This is a photograph of the upper lid. You also see another line which is this shiny white line which is the mucocutaneous junction. This is just posterior to the meibomian gland orifices whereas the grey line is anterior to the meibomian gland orifices because the grey line splits the intermarginal strip uh, or the lid into the anterior and the posterior lamella. Um, and this uh, line is known as the mucocutaneous junction. This is very important because this is the junction between the skin which comes up to this point of the eyelid and the conjunctiva which starts from then onwards. Uh, you can also um, demarcate the mucocutaneous junction or this line by uh, doing a fluorescent stain. There is no actual staining but the fluorescent uh, is able to clearly demarcate uh, the conjunctival part from the skin part, you can see that there is no actual collection of fluorescein on the skin, uh, whereas the there is uh, and uh, on the conjunctival part and because there is a slight depression here at the mucocutaneous junction anatomically, a bit of the fluorescein pools here, it gives a nice linear appearance to this line. So, if you are not able to pick it up on just um, white light examination, you can use the cobalt blue filter and the fluorescein to uh, make this distinction. Here is a, a higher magnification photograph of the same, the intermarginal strip with the slight depression here, the fluorescein collects and shows you very nicely the mucocutaneous junction. Note that the mucocutaneous junction is just posterior to the opening of the meibomian glands uh, and this is where the conjunctiva or, or the palpebral or tarsal conjunctiva starts and the eyelid skin ends. Now, moving on, this is a photograph of the uh, tarsal plate or the um, tarsal conjunctiva in the upper lid. This is an inverted photograph. This is the uh, actually the uh, superior margin of the tarsal which is covered by the conjunctiva because this lid is inverted. Um, and you can see that these are the normal appearance of the vessels. So, some come from the superior border of the tarsus 
and um, um, you know you have other vessels coming from the lid margin towards the center this is absolutely normal for these vessels to be there this is not an inflamed tarsal conjunctiva i just wanted to show you that and um, um, also remember that the mimomian glands are usually not visible uh, when you evert and look it's not visible to the naked eye or to white light you need infrared photography to see the mimomian glands uh, in the upper lid because they, the tarsus is very thick uh, it's about uh, 12 uh, 10 to 12 millimeters in uh, height and also quite thick so the mimomian glands which are deep inside are not visible although there are you know um, 30 to 40 glands in the upper lids you can't basically see them uh, with white light However, in the lower lid, the tarsus is very short. It's only about four millimeters in height, and it's also not as thick as in the upper lids. And so, even with white light or the naked eye, you will be able to make out the mimomian glands in the lower eye lid. Here, of course, you can see that the eyelid is pathological. Over here, you can trace the fluorescein staining very nicely and see that the mucocutaneous junction is very abnormal. Uh, it's distorted. You can also see that there's crusting in the eyelid skin. Um, there are uh, there is uh, uh, tarsal scarring, subepithelial tarsal scarring over here, uh, and you can also see that there is severe mimomian gland dropout. So you can't see the orifices at all. It looks like you know scarring has destroyed all of them. So this is obviously a case of secretizing conjunctivitis. Of course, just by looking at the eyelids, we are not we won't be able to say what is the cause but I'm just trying to show you the extent of the pathology here. In the photographs at the bottom, these are very straightforward. You see uh, papillary reaction. The reason that you see papillae on the tarsal conjunctiva and you don't see it on the bulbar conjunctiva is because the uh, palpebral or tarsal conjunctiva is very firmly adherent to the underlying tarsus, which is not the case in the bulbar surface where it is very loosely adherent to the underlying tenons and it is also redundant so that the eye can move. On the tarsus, it's firmly fixed. And when there is chronic congestion, then as the cornea becomes a little bit, as the conjunctiva becomes a little bit boggy uh, and swollen, uh, it swells within these, uh, you know, attachments or these adhesions to the tarsus. And so it gives you this polygonal kind of a, uh, appearance uh, as if it is getting inflamed uh, within these uh, polygonal shapes because the adhesions restrict a global more diffuse uh, congestion from showing up on the tarsal surface and sometimes you can have uh, you know uh, discharge which collects within this these uh, papillae and this is one of the main uh, stimuli for uh, children with um, uh, with vernal keratoconjunctivitis for them to rub their eyes because they want to get this discharge out and if you sometimes ask these children how they do it they will actually show you uh, which is very gruesome of how they flip the lid and actually uh, grab and pull this ropey discharge out. The other distinction that you need to make here is that the papillae on the right side look a little bit atrophic. So this is a much more chronic uh, phenomenon on the uh, photograph on your right side, whereas this is more of an, uh, uh, of maybe not acute, but not as chronic as the photograph on your right. Here you see obvious lid margin keratinization in the photograph on the top. There is uh, posterior migration, of course, of the mucocutaneous junction. It should have been somewhere over here uh, where the myomian glands, but the myomian glands are also gone in both the photographs on the top and the bottom. Uh, so you can see some of the atrophied myomian glands in the photograph in the bottom. So the mucocutaneous junction should have been here, but it has actually migrated posteriorly. And this is what you see very commonly in Steven Johnson syndrome, but you can also see lid margin keratinization in several other causes of secretizing conjunctivitis. The photograph on your top is a row of dystichiatic lashes. Dystichiasis is different from trichiasis. Trichiasis uh, means that the lashes are normal in position, which means that they are in the anterior lamina, but they are misdirected. Instead of uh, going forwards and downwards or forwards and upwards as in the lower lid and upper lid respectively, they are actually uh, pointed towards another direction. So that would be trichiasis. But here what you see is dystichiasis where the there is a, a metaplasia of the myomian glands and they turn into uh, glands that then produce hair follicles. And these hair follicles because of the direction of the myomian glands 
are directed posteriorly. As you can understand, the myoboman glands are in the tarsal plate, which is in the posterior lamella of the eyelid. And the uh, myoboman glands are directed towards the eye because the idea is that the glands will secrete their mebum uh, towards the ocular surface and it will mix with the tear film. So, when these turn into hair follicle producing glands, then these uh, glands are therefore uh, the hairs that come out of them uh, point uh, towards the eye and this is very problematic, more problematic than tracheatic lashes because all of them are always directed at the eye and cause can cause severe uh, keratopathy. Also very difficult to treat with electrolysis because the root of the hair follicle is very deeply embedded in the tarsus and often needs multiple application. Uh, the photograph on the bottom basically shows you atrophied mimomian glands when you have chronic inflammation. Um, you can have or keratinization of the lid margin, you can have myoboman gland atrophy and the myoboman gland basically breaks up. So, you know typically this is how a myoboman gland would look in the lower lid, but uh, when these individual acini, uh, you know when the duct gets blocked, the individual acini uh, get sequestered and they break up into this you know uh, ferny kind of pattern and uh, you see them, uh, you know these individual acini are still alive but the gland itself is very distorted and gone. Um, and here, um, uh, these are sub epithelial, these are different from concretions and you can see these very clearly if you do a mybography. Uh, you must remember that this basically indicates that the mybomian glands are inactive um, and uh, you know these are not going to respond to any kind of therapy. Uh, this is very commonly mistaken as uh, keratinization because it looks white and keratin also looks white. Uh, but this is not keratinization. Here if you see the mucocutinous junction actually in this photograph, then you will be able to see that the mucocutinous junction is actually quite intact. Uh, there is nothing wrong with the mucocutinous junction per se. Coming to the medial canthus, uh, you have the caruncle over here and you have the semilunar fold on the middle part of the conjunctiva. This is the normal position of the semilunar fold and you can see how closely abutted to the globe the puncta is over here and it is draining all the tears uh, through this and this is the normal position of the caruncle and the caruncle may contain, uh, contain a few hair follicles over here uh, and the semilunar fold. Um, you can have medial canthal uh, fibrosis and uh, you can have uh, loss of the plica like over here you see you do not see the fold anymore. This is just a symblepharon which is connecting the upper and the lower lid and you can see the keratinization over here, the normal appearance of the caruncle is gone. So, this uh, caruncular fibrosis, medial canthal fibrosis or loss of plica is one of the very early and subtle signs of cicatrizing conjunctivitis which you should also pay attention to and sometimes this fibrosis uh, you are not able to make out unless you actually hold the lid apart and, uh, apart and ask the patient uh, to look. Um, in the uh, opposite direction. So, you ask the patient to abduct the eye and you can also see that because of uh, this problem like from the uh, previous photograph, if you uh, pay attention, you can see that even with when we are taking this photograph, the puncta is pointed towards the eye. But here, you know as we are uh, trying to hold the lids apart, you can easily see that the puncta now is pointing towards you which means that there is an abnormal uh, malposition of the lid also because of that. And normally the semilunar fold in abduction stays in place because uh, you know it is a redundant fold. So, it will actually not move from place. So, irrespective of whether the patient looks in the primary position or abducts the eye, the semilunar fold will more or less hold its position. But in cases where there is fibrosis subconjunctivally, uh, the semilunar fold will be dragged. So, here you can see that the fold essentially is being dragged. It should have been somewhere over here. Uh, but it is getting dragged temporarily. This is in a case of a primary pterygium. Uh, it can get dragged even more in recurrent pterygium or a case of pseudo pterygium like a symblepharon. Uh, this is the normal lateral canthus. Uh, one of the differences that you should be able to notice now uh, since I have shown you the medial canthus already is that the lateral canthus is typically a more oval uh, or curved appearance. Whereas, the medial canthus we noticed was more of an angular appearance, the lateral canthus uh, is more uh, has a more curved appearance and there you can see that there is a, an actual gap, uh, you can see a slight shadow here between the conjunctiva because of the redundancy of the uh, conjunctiva and, and, and a gap between the globe and the uh, canthus here, it is not 
uh, attach uh, um, to the lids and which is also a normal uh, if you ask the patient to adduct and just pull the uh, lateral canthus up a little bit you will also be able to see the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland and this is how it looks like so you can see this you know uh, multilobulated structure over here this is the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland and um, this is what produces the aqueous component of the tear film and in patients with Sjogren's or Steven Johnson syndrome you can actually see fibrosis so you can see here the fibrotic bands that are there uh, within the lacrimal gland which are uh, essentially uh, distorting the normal appearance so you don't see the normal lobulated appearance anymore you see a much more flatter gland because of the subconjunctival fibrosis that has affected uh, the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland so if you are you know seeing ocular surface cases in patients with dry eyes you should make a habit of just uh, pulling the upper eyelid a little bit more extra so that you can also examine the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland along with your entire ocular surface examination. This is the normal inferior phonics. I want to make two quick points here that because again if the patient is looking up uh, the redundancy of the conjunctiva here you actually do not see the point where the palpebral uh, conjunctiva meets the bulbar conjunctiva. All you see are these redundant folds that the conjunctiva is thrown in. Uh, and you essentially see a shadow beyond which the actual point of continuity between the bulbar and the palpebral conjunctiva occurs. So you actually can't see the phonics, particularly in the in, in the superior phonics. You actually, you know, you just see a hollow or a shadow, a gap between the lid and the upper part of the globe. You don't actually see the phonics. If you can see the phonics that means that there is shortening. For example, in this photograph, you see that there is a continuity uh, between the bulbar and the palpebral conjunctiva. Uh, and uh, this means that here you should have, be, you should have seen folds uh, in the conjunctiva which you are not seeing uh, and th this is uh, essentially phonicial foreshortening. It is very important that you are able to pick up phonicial foreshortening early. So, you know, not when it is very obvious and you see bands of symblephron uh, uh, going from the uh, tarsal or palpebral conjunctiva onto uh, or close to the limbus, etc. That is, you know, obvious that everybody can see. But this is the subtle appearance of an inferior phonicial shortening which you will be able to notice. So, the first thing that you do when you have the patient sit on your slit lamp is just put your thumbs on the lower lid, both eyes, ask the patient to look up, pull the lid down and just make a quick assessment if you can see those redundant folds or not. If you are not, if you can't, then do a more detailed examination of sit lamp and see if you can see the continuity and if you can see the continuity as you can see here, uh, you can see that there is severe shortening over here and uh, slightly less on this side, you can see a little bit of a fold here and, and this is an early sign of phonicial foreshortening which you should be able to pick up. Now, this is the normal uh, fluorescein uh, appearance when you put it in the, um, the you mix fluorescein in the tear film. Uh, you can see this wavy pattern of staining here, you can see and this uh, is actually not staining, it is again pulling off the fluorescein uh, uh, stained tear film within the redundant folds of the conjunctiva. This is absolutely normal and these folds or crypts in the uh, bulbar conjunctiva are normal. They are there because the bulbar conjunctiva is redundant, it is extra. It is very loosely attached to the underlying tenons uh, so that we can move the eyeball in all directions and it does not get pulled or stretched when we try to move the eye around. So this is again normal, these waves, wavy patterns of fluorescein staining or pulling, not staining actually, is, 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 is the normal pattern that you should see. You see it also on the temporal bulbar conjunctiva, again you see these waves uh, because of the folds in particularly in the uh, lateral part of the bulbar conjunctiva because this is the most redundant part of the conjunctiva. You see these folds which is again the normal appearance uh, of how fluorescein looks over here. This is uh, an eye with a normal pigmented limbus and I am going to show you a slightly higher magnification of the same. Uh, here that is the photograph on the top. Uh, here you can see that the limbal palisades are pigmented and uh, therefore very easy to uh, pick out. Okay, And in the bottom you have examples of uh, example of a uh, palisades which are uh, not pigmented and the pigmentation essentially is depends on the pigmentation of the person. Okay, So, it is racial. 
So people who are dark skinned will have pigmented limbers, people who are fair skinned will not have pigmented limbers and therefore it is important for you to be able to identify the palisade irrespective of pigmentation. And I have mentioned this uh, in my earlier talk in uh, when I was describing SLET also that when you are doing a limbal biopsy you should know the landmarks so that you are able to identify the limbers irrespective of its pigmentation. So you know exactly where it starts and where it ends. Uh, and the pigmentation should not be your only landmark because in many cases there is no pigmentation. Um, in, in this uh, lightly pigmented individual at the bottom, uh, you can also see these very nice, uh, uh, you know, limbal vessels which are uh, forming these loops over here. And if you do an OCT angiography uh, of this area, you will see the loopy pattern of these vessels, which is again the normal um, vascular pattern in this area. These are some abnormalities of the limbus. Uh, you can see a small Horner Tantras dot over here which uh, uh, indicates that there is a limbal inflammation. So you can see here that this part of the limbus is a bit hazy, it looks a little bit thickened and this is typically what you see um, in um, vernal keratoconjunctivitis uh, especially if the patient has uh, macropapillae on the uh, tarsal conjunctiva. What you see in the bottom, um, you see this in patients with chronic limbal inflammation. Again, allergy conjunctivitis is probably the most common example of that. You see stretching of the palisades. So, you know, the palisades should have been over here in the normal position, but now the palisades are getting stretched. And this is um, um, an indication of the limbus being stressed. And, and the next thing that is going to happen in the course of thing is that there will be atrophy of the palisades and loss of the limbal stem cells. Uh, on the top and the bottom again you see these gelatinous degenerations that can also happen. You can even see cystic um, degeneration in this area sometimes in patients with chronic uh, allergy conjunctivitis and eye rubbing. But here what we see is basically pigmentation uh, uh, in both these cases in the upper part of the limbus and lower part of the limbus and also this gelatinous kind of degeneration uh, of, uh, at the limbus which is also a, uh, a mark of uh, limbal dysfunction. Now these all these four pathologies that I showed you in the previous slide and this slide these are actually reversible with anti-inflammatory uh, therapy and if you start that early enough uh, with months of treatment the limbus can actually start appearing normal. But these are examples of when uh, the limbus has been distorted to the extent that it cannot become normal anymore and the patient has developed limbal stem cell deficiency. On your left is a patient with a pseudoterygium. So you can see partial conjunctalization of the cornea. There are no normal palisades uh, visible anymore. There is some scarring at the head of the spanners and you can see uh, vessels that have now encroached onto the corneal uh, surface. On your left, uh, here you see like there is a global kind of a dermalization of the entire ocular surface you can still make out. So here you see there is the continuity is, the, uh, is lost. So you can see that uh, the cornea uh, has been covered partly by conjunctiva. Here it is not. You can still make out that the cornea and the conjunctiva look very different. But all of it is uh, covered now with keratinized uh, uh, epithelium rather than non-keratinized epithelium. Normally the cornea and the conjunctival epithelium is non-keratinized unlike the skin. But here all the epithelium looks like a thin layer of skin has grown over the entire ocular surface. This a lot of people believe is not a form of limbal stem cell deficiency but just diffuse squamous metaplasia because of chronic inflammation um, and uh, dry eyes. So both of these uh, are, are, ch are changes where it shows that the you know the, the limbal cells are affected and it won't reverse with medical therapy but the etiology and the pathogenesis are very different. When you put fluorescein on the ocular surface and because fluorescein staining is a very important component of um, your ocular surface examination and also when you are trying to see what are the pathological changes, is there any staining, is there any epithelial defects and so on and so forth and there are so many other applications that I talked about earlier. When you put the, you know, dilute the fluorescein into the tear film, the entire tear film, um, uh, you know, it then becomes fluorescent when you look at the blue lights and this is the initial appearance. The whole tear film appears a little bit you know greenish yellow and which is fine but if you look at it a little while later then you will be able to see that now um, whatever staining has occurred or pooling has occurred you can focus on those areas because now the fluorescein is not you know diffused it's more diluted and you can only see the more concentrated fluorescein along the upper and lower 
eyelid margins where it is slowly draining into the punctum. So if, if you pay close attention, you will also see the movement of the fluorescein from lateral to medial. So that's why in this photograph, you see that there is more concentration medially because that's where it is being sucked in by the, uh, by the puncta, whereas uh, 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 not so much present uh, laterally. Now I'll show you some of the staining patterns that may help you in making certain diagnosis. Uh, on your bottom left, uh, the inset, it basically shows you what a true dendrite looks like. And on the inset in your bottom right shows you what a geographical ulcer looks like. These are both manifestations of herpetic eye disease, uh, HSV1, HSV2 infection. Um, uh, but the photograph in the background is actually what is known as a pseudo dendrite. Okay, this is not a true dendrite. So when an epithelial defect heals, and I explained this in my earlier talk in the in the in the slet uh, explained lecture where I said that when the epithelium heals after a large epithelial defects, it forms these uh, uh, you know convex sheets of epithelium growing from the periphery towards the center. And when these sheets coalesce, you know then uh, what you see in between. Uh, at the center, you have the, all the uh, uh, irregular epithelium and that sometimes looks like a dendrite. So basically, this is the last part of the epithelium which is kind of, uh, which is kind of uh, you know, uh, healing after the epithelial sheets have moved in from all directions and the central part is the part which heals last. And the patients, uh, as long as they have this irregular epithelium, will continue to have a little bit of blurred vision. You see this very commonly also in patients who have recurrent colon erosions. You know, sometimes uh, patients will come in and say that their kid, they got a paper cut injury or they had an injury with a child's nail or their own nail. And uh, you will see that there's hypertrophic epithelium, uh, which is a sign of epi the epithelial defect having just healed in. And they have a little bit of bloody vision because of the irregular acetic management because it's bang in the center. And if you give it some time and lubricants and maybe sometimes a bandage contact lens application, uh, the epithelium becomes uh, very smooth over the course of the next two or three weeks. This is again a very important pattern of fluorescent staining and I want you to understand the difference in the staining pattern uh, in the photograph on the top and the photograph beneath. On the top, you see uh, fluorescent staining and here what is happening is when the tight junction between the cells, when the ep corneal epithelium is stressed, and the tight junction between the cells open up, then the fluorescein kind of collects in between and that's what we see as superficial punctate ker keratitis. And here, here you can see very confluent SPKs, uh, but these are limited as you can see to this inferior half of the cornea. And this is basically limited to the inferior half of the cornea because this is the exposed part of the cornea. This is the part of the cornea which is in between um, uh, the two lids or the interpalpebral area. And you see the staining in the interpalpebral area. This is typically what you see in patients who have exposure or patients who have dry eyes, okay? Uh, because the staining is mostly limited to the inferior half, which is more chronically exposed. Uh, but if you see the photograph uh, beneath, uh, it, it, it is very different. Uh, you don't see a global staining in the inferior one third or the inferior half of the cornea, but you see these uh, tongue shaped uh, uh, or these geographical kind of uh, staining and it seems that the abnormal epithelium is coming from the limbus. This is very typically seen in those patients who are on some kind of systemic medication, typically neurological medication, lithium causes this, amiodarone causes this, but it's not prescribed very commonly anymore, but lithium still is for those people who have manic conditions. And uh, you see uh, this kind of a keratopathy change. So this basically means that there is some kind of a chronic uh, collection or deposition within the limbal cells, uh, they are abnormal and as they are growing into the limbus and they are carrying that abnormal substance with them, uh, it makes them a little bit of abnormal and gives rise to this kind of a wavy characteristic geographical staining without a defect. So please learn to make this distinction. Also um, look for what I call differential staining and differential staining is very very important um, it basically tells you that there is something, uh, it tells you where the problem is essentially. So you see here in this uh, photograph on your left side, you have staining which is restricted to the nasal half uh, of the cornea, whereas in the, on, on the slide on your right, in the photograph on your right, you see that, that there is a, a patch of staining at the superior, uh, near the superior limbus with some associated vessels coming in from the limbus. 
you also see staining which is restricted here in the inferior limbus and you also see that there is staining in the central part of the cornea. Now all of these things are telling you a different story. In the, photo, in the, in the photograph on your left, it means that there is something wrong in the medial part of the upper or the lower eyelid which is causing uh, these erosions and uh, this pattern of staining and the stressing out the epithelium. And uh, if this patient actually has, and I have shown this earlier in the lid keratinization talk also, keratinization that is only restricted to the medial part of the upper lid. Whereas in the photograph on your left, uh, the staining in the superior part of the cornea and uh, on the photograph on the right, the staining in the superior part of the cornea and the inferior part of the cornea are because of lid margin changes, but the staining in the central part of the cornea is actually uh, because of the dry eye and exposure. So, uh, it's very important to know what when you put fluorescein, something that you will be doing forever, what the normal ocular surface which is you know now you know coated with the film of fluorescein what it looks like and as it is washed away what is left behind and what information you can gather uh, from the signs that you see on the ocular surface um, as the fluores fluorescein is washed away and uh, the uh, patterns that you see on, on the cornea tell you a lot about the location of the pathology and where you should look for the problem so that you can make a correct diagnosis and treatment. All right, that brings me uh, to the end of this talk. So, we looked at what was normal. Uh, we looked at certain examples of when this normal is distorted and we look uh, and the ocular surface develops certain abnormal features. And I hope that now you have learned how to recognize the normal. It will make it easier for you to identify the abnormal. I want to leave you with this final piece of message that the examination of the patient does not begin when the patient sits on, on, on the chair and you switch on the and the swing the slit lamp into position and switch the light on and start looking at the eye. You should try to pay attention of how the patient blinks, how, uh, uh, how complete the blink is, um, what are the other things that the patient is doing, what is the pigmentation around the eye. Uh, what is the normal position of the uh, eyelids, what is the normal direction of the lashes, all of these things are gross examination. And you know a lot of old timers will tell us, you know these are things that we used to do much better with the torch lamp, but now because we make this patient stay directly at the slit lamp, we miss these findings. But you still have the opportunity to pick up these findings when you greet the patient, you take the patient into the room, the patient comes and sits in front of you, you re review the history and you are conversing with the patient, it actually gives you a great opportunity to look at all of these things before you start to look and do uh, look more closely and do a more detailed examination uh, of the ocular surface. So I hope that this talk was helpful. I would love to hear your feedback and also suggestions on what other topics you would like me to speak on. Um, so please, uh, you know, uh, give me your suggestions, criticisms, feedback, and I will be happy to improve on all of these aspects and uh, and you know prepare talks which uh, on on topics that you may be interested uh, about thank you so much for listening and until next time